Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is um, Wednesday, the 28th, and we are here for another great discussion this evening for a pre-arrest diversion. This is the latest in a series of Facebook Live discussions brought to you by the Kane County State's Attorney, Jamie Mosser. My name is Curtis Spivey, and I'm the host of Good Morning Aurora, and I'm happy to moderate and be involved in this important community discussion and initiative. I would like to thank all parties for their participation. Our discussion this evening is on pre-arrest diversion, also known as PAD. Pre-arrest diversion provides case management support and connection to wraparound services to individuals repeatedly encountering the criminal justice system. The most common reasons are substance abuse, a lack of resources, and untreated mental health issues. Pre-arrest diversion is an option eligible only to nonviolent and low-level offenders. Our guests this evening are Sergeant Tony Regano, Elgin PD, Martha Paschke, Coordinator of King County Pre-Arrest Diversion, State's Attorney Jamie Mosser, um, Melina Wilson, Case Manager, Pre-Arrest um, pre Diversion, and Mr. Daryl Pass, who has many hats. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let me read all of your hats, dear sir. Uh, our flyer here. Uh, you are the founder and CEO of New Beginnings Recovery Mission, mm -hmm. and also manager of recovery support services for the Kenneth Young Center. Yes, I am. All right. Uh, how are you guys tonight? Well, Fantastic. Good. All right, all right. Uh, we thank everyone also for tuning in uh, to this important discussion tonight. All right. Um, so according to the, this will be the uh, first question how we start off this evening. Um, according to the Kane County State's Attorney's Office 2021 annual report, the creation or implementation of this initiative emphasizes rehabilitation over incarceration. What does the criminal justice system learn that has brought about this shift in priorities? And we'll start with you, Sergeant. Sure. You know, I think it kind of started with the war on drugs and it kind of started with seeing that you can't really arrest your way out of certain problems. It doesn't do any good to the system to inundate the system with low-level drug offenses. It doesn't do people who are victims of crimes who, who are ended up on loaded dockets to have to deal with these, these overcrowding issues in our systems. And so anytime you inundate a system, whether it be a hospital system, the criminal justice system, you're going to end up having a tougher time getting good outcomes and getting better service for everybody involved. So if you can, instead of inundating a system, see that there are underlying problems that are driving the behavior, you can actually divert that person away out of the system, which frees up the system to be more effective in general, but it also gets that person into a, a system of care that's actually going to be more beneficial to them and actually might not just address that crime that they, that they committed or were alleged to have commit, but also prevent a future one by creating stability in their life. I'd like to say also that this is a, a great panel to have here, a wide range of experiences Sergeant of the Police Department, the case manager, the coordinator of the program that we're talking about, uh, state's attorney and a person from the community too. So that's very um, interesting to know. Ms. Paschke? I think um, what Sergeant Morgano said is absolutely true. It, you know, we've learned from what we've done historically that that doesn't always work. That criminal justice response isn't always the best response to individuals that have other issues underneath that are causing them to show up repeatedly for law enforcement and those issues don't necessarily get addressed through the system. We're lucky in King County that we have a sheriff who does do some of that work in his jail so we're a little bit different but that doesn't mean that he has the capacity to serve everybody for those low-level non-violent offenses <coughs> in the way that he's working through his jail. Um, so it's really just that historic perspective that what we've done in the past with the war on drugs hasn't worked. Right. State's turn. So for me, I always I love the saying, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same results. I have prosecuted the same people over and over again in the same ways with the same sentence and it just doesn't do what we're supposed to do. So for my purposes, we have to think of something different. Now we need jails and we need prisons because there are bad people out there who truly hurt our community. And that is what jails and prisons are designed for. But there are people who just need help and they need a different path. And by having put them through the system before, we already put them down the path that they're gonna to continue to go on. 
So instead of doing that, now we're reinvent <coughs> reinventing what we're thinking. Okay, this didn't work. Jail and prison didn't stop this. Let's try something else. Let's try again to look at you as who you are, humanize the situation, and help you get down the path that you really do want to go down. Okay. Ms. Wilson, as a uh, case manager? Um, first, I would like to say thank the officers for realizing when there should be an arrest and when there should be help offered. And when those um, encounters with officers take place and officers feel like we can help, then we step in and we build reports with the client, we give them a voice and whatever reasoning they enter these justice system, we find out the whys, um, assist in the underlying issues. Um, if I could say, we definitely, as case managers, as PADS, do not or is not concerned with whatever these offenses may be. We are concerned why. And those whys can come in substance, mental health, whatever it is. Those are the things that we're assisting in. Um, we prioritize, we give goals small goals so they could achieve those goals so they know that it is possible to do so. Um, we advocate, we support, we work with other agencies, we do whatever it takes to make progress with our clients. Uh, and I want to just say for the, for the benefit of the viewers right now, you guys just had a, well you guys, the Kane County State Attorney's Office and PASH, you had an event not that long ago at the Aurora Public Library downtown. Uh, so before we get into the second question, which I think will really speak to Mr. King, how did that event go? I think it went pretty well. I think it was great. Okay. It was very well attended. Yeah. All right. Good to know. Good to know. Uh, because the Aurora Public Library is a great place to do things, and folks, when we share the news about these kind of initiatives, mm -hmm. we do hope the community can actually go out there, take part, and benefit in it. Um, so the second question now. Will uh, it's for all of us, but I think this will speak to Mr. Uh, to Daryl to you real quick. Uh, I'll preface it with a little bit of history. Seattle, Washington, and King County Sheriff's Office were the first in the nation to use this model, it was created to address low-level drug and prostitution crimes. All relevant organizations, from the police department to Washington's ACLU, were involved in Kane County. Besides the folks represented here. Uh, where other individuals and organizations are involved in helping yourself, sir. Can you tell us about the um, the work that you do and the Kenneth Young Center as well? Yes, well, New Beginnings Recovery Mission was something that um, I'm very passionate about. It came about, uh, let me just say that I'm a person uh, that's a little different than at this table. I've lived this. I'm a person that struggled with substances. Uh, for 30 plus years, 23 of those years was heroin and crack cocaine every day. Today, 10 years removed from that adversity. During the time that I was immersed in that, this type of collaboration was non-existent. There was no gray area. It was either you do or you don't. And if you do, you're going to be attached to the criminal justice system. And to State's Attorney uh, Mosser's point, yes, you repeat that over and over and over and over again. And I'll tell you something, for me, there was no jump off. When I was connected to the system and did my time, guess what I did as soon as I was released? I went right back to my behavior because nothing was in place to negate that. And that's all I knew. And to your point about the why, it wasn't until I got motivated and had somewhat of an understanding about my why that I was able to come out of that. And so getting sober and the facility, which was Lutheran, uh, Lutheran Social Services, where I got sober, went to treatment. I lived in a halfway house for a particular amount of time that I went to sober living because it takes time for this thinking to change. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a big part of it. Uh, and we can't forget that. Uh, but working in the facility um, and going back and getting that education, I started seeing that recidivism. And I'm wondering why I'm seeing people that are dying at rapid numbers, people who are leaving treatment, and then you hear it about a week or two later, they're in jail, or they've made a transition, death, um, or they're coming back into the, to the uh, treatment center. And so I understood that recovery was the piece. What is the reason 
for this. Treatment is very important. Amenities like this resource, pre-arrest diversion, is very important. I like how you laid that out because we have to dissect that and get to the why. And sometimes that why is attached to substance use as well as mental health. And what I found out, and I was one of those people impacted by that, that that underlying issue could be some level of trauma. Um, now that's an interesting that's an interesting point about trauma, which speaks to the last discussion that we had uh, here with the King County State's Attorney and different partners. Um, I do want to I do want to ask um, a question: Why is now the right time for this program in King County? I was just I was just looking at you at the moment when I asked yeah, the question. Yeah, no, that wasn't just for you. <laughs> Understood. No, the, the reason now is the answer is because we, we didn't do it until now. I mean, there, there, there's no reason that now is different than any other time other than the right people in the right places with State's Attorney Mosser and, you know, law enforcement partners willing to step up. And I think sometimes what I've found in any collaboration I've, I've been a part of, whether it's pre-arrest diversion or other things I've done or been a part of, I should say, is that <clears throat> sometimes somebody just stepping up or usually a couple somebody stepping up and saying hey this should have been done a long time ago why aren't we doing it so it's not that now was the time or that all of a sudden it seemed like the right time it's that finally the right people in the right places said i think we've seen enough i think we need to do this and you know i mean it was a john mayer said waiting on the world to change you can't sit back and wait you cannot you gotta go make a change that's right and so i think i think now being the time is more that than it is anything else okay but i have um, to add to that though yeah. And, and understanding the perspective I'm coming from, you as a, a law enforcement agent and me as just a, a community uh, member, this situation has gotten so vast. It used to be that it was just looked at as an urban situation. Let's, let's, let's be real here. But now it has just crossed all boundaries. And what we're fortunate enough is to have individuals like State's Attorney Monster and Sergeant Regano and, and Ron Hain, who he always says this, you know, Department of Corrections, there has been no correcting until now. Right. And so we're grateful to have these folks who are in a position to initiate this change and hopefully it'll saturate our communities. But up until now, it was not. It was just, oh, that's their problem. It's just a problem. It'll go away. It was a sweeping under the rug. It was turned, you know, to the, the the other side. But now, that's not the case because it is affecting everyone right. in some shape, form, or fashion. The time is six. We, I'm sorry. Sorry. I was no, just going to say. I think we've reached a cultural tipping point. Yes. When it comes to police community relationships, as well as acknowledgement of mental illness and substance use, and how we address those things, and the fact that trauma underlies that and I think that there's been movement throughout all of these different fields culturally and societally that have come together to finally say all right enough's enough we have to do something Absolutely. because if you look yes we had the right people at the right time in the right places here in Kane County which is why we're the first site doing this in Illinois um, but if you look across the country it's happening in other places right um, and for all of those same reasons, in other places, they've been lucky to have the right people in the right place at the right time. Um, and to jump back quickly, if I can, Absolutely. to your question. Really. Because, the, because the next one was for you. So yeah, we, we can stay with this. We can stay here. We can stay here. No, I just wanted to jump back and give credit to all the other people that are involved in this. Sure. Um, one of the unique things about the lead model is that it's a highly collaborative model. And so when I'm talking about you know the mental health field, law enforcement, criminal justice, everybody kind of coming to the table together, that's what the lead model is about. Okay. So we have a policy coordinating group that oversees and advises on policies for our initiative. And that's made up of elected officials from all over King County. It's made up of agency directors from around King County. Law enforcement sits on that. Um, representatives from our community leadership team, which you didn't give yourself credit. Oh, you're <laughs> on that too? He's the chairperson yes. for our community leadership Curtis, what team. what doesn't he do? Okay, yeah, I said that. <laughs> Don't be <laughs> modest, brother. We're on camera. <laughs> um, so we have, I think we have about 18 members of the policy okay. coordinating group who are leaders in the county who are all involved together in that. 
we also have, I think, 10 to 15 on the community leadership team that yes. Daryl Pass oversees as the chairperson. Um, and that is community level activists, mm -hmm. people from communities that are most affected and impacted, individuals who know that work really well and know who, who we're serving and who we benefit through this work. And they come together monthly to talk about how they can spread the word throughout the community. Right. And they're a critical piece of this. So, and then we also have an operations work group that's law enforcement, the state's attorney's office, the public defender's office, our case managers coming together twice a month to staff the cases and make sure that the people we're serving aren't falling through cracks. Um, and then anybody in a service agency that's working with those individuals can come to those meetings too if they have an issue they need to bring up so that we're collaborating on their care to make sure that we're helping them move forward. It kind of reminds me about what Melina uh, said, the, you're not worried about the why. No. Because no. the why has been taken we're looking, care we're of. We're looking for the why. We're, looking for we're the, not okay, worried about me. why they answered our program. Right, right. that's the what why. it was. And sometimes, and we're just using substance abuse. If you're using substance abuse, we want to know why. Right. We can't just say, okay, well, this person come in as a referral and they have substance abuse and should think, oh, well, this person needs treatment. No. It's for us to build this rapport with them to sit down and talk, to hear what we see that they need or what we thought we they needed to see something different. We give them, I say, like I said, that voice to prioritize what they feel like is needed first. And what they feel like is needed first, we make suggestions. Okay, well, let's talk about this and let's go through the pros and cons and just allowing them to have a say in how we're assisting them. And Curtis, and, this yeah. is important. Sure. Yep. What Melina is saying, because our system, Sergeant Regano and I, we're coercive. We tell you what we think you need. Wow. Now, sometimes that's based off of assessments, and we try, but we also look at the charge, because the charge dictates a lot of what we do. Right. You're here for possession of a controlled substance, go get treatment. It doesn't deal with anything else. So what Melina is saying mm -hmm. is what makes the difference in this program from what a court system does. Right. Because people look at the court system and they're like, why not? We've always had a court system. Why shouldn't we continue to do it? Right. Well, the problem is we haven't solved all the world's problems. Right. We still have record numbers of people coming through our system. And but for somebody like Melina who sits down and finds out what they actually need and does it at the rate of which they're ready to do it, we're just going to see them all over again. Um, now that that brings me to um, that brings me to we're gonna we're gonna go with this question next because we can do that. What should so how will this financially benefit King County? If so, it's thousands of dollars to prosecute somebody. So if you think about it this way, a police officer or two or three arrest somebody. They're spending time writing a police report. They are bringing them to the jail holding them in the jail in their department. I'm not even talking about our department yet. Um, you're holding them, you're feeding them, you're caring for them, people are watching them. This is all costing money. Then they're transported over here to our jail. They sit there, they wait for bond call. We have a bond call. In the bond call, there's a judge, a prosecutor, a public defender, um, court security, bailiffs. There's a lot of people who are involved in that. And that is within the first day or two of when the arrest happens. It takes months for court cases to be resolved. And sometimes it's because we're collecting all the discovery, giving it to the defense attorney, and then the defendant gets to make the choice about what they want to do with the case. This costs thousands of dollars. Instead of doing that to get to an end result, which we hope works, which is, hey, do the treatment that we think is okay. Instead, they're going to the case managers who are saying, okay, what do you need right now? How can we help you? And you're not involving all of the rest of us but they're still being held accountable for what they did. They're just being held accountable in a different way that we have not seen here a in Illinois, a right. caring way. Right. And okay. actually, the lead model did a cost analysis back in uh, 2017, 19, because they started in 2011. Um, and what they found was about an $8,000 savings per person that was being served through pre arrest diversion instead of going through the system as usual. An eight thousand an eight thousand dollar per year saving per person per year. Per year. Wow. 
And think That's about, though, the lack of people who, if they're in the system and they're not overdosing, they're not going to the hospitals. Right. If they're not having more police officers called, they're not going for other medical care. Like, there's other aspects that we're never going to be able to quantify because we don't know if a person's going to overdose. But the chances are, if they're in pre-arrest diversion, they may not see that versus either being in our system and having no care or just having nothing whatsoever. Um, so, Mr. Pass, mm -hmm. New Beginnings Recovery Mission, how do they help or assist in this new initiative? I think you spoke briefly of it, but can you also talk about that and Kenneth Young? Well, for New Beginnings Recovery Mission, one of the, the biggest things for individuals who struggle with substance use, um, who go into treatment, uh, come out of treatment or are formerly incarcerated, the biggest issues they run into is housing. And so New Beginnings provides sober living. Okay. And sober living is where an individual is able to reside sober uh, and get some things together. Most of these folks come through New Beginnings with no job, no driver's license, um, very little connection with a support system. And so we nurture that. Um, I am involved with, here in Kane County, uh, the Sheriff's Office has an employment program through Judy Dawson, heads up, that she helps individuals get trained with forklift uh, certifications and things of that sort. I'm connected to the uh, temporary uh, employment agencies in the area. To get these gentlemen, because right now I'm only working with gentlemen. Okay. Actually, I believe a situation like mine until I have women who are able to accommodate that. But there's a reason for that. I, I honestly think that men should help men to a certain degree. You know, um, but to help these guys with the resources to get up on their feet. You know, I give a case of a point. I just had a guy who left this past Saturday. He was there with me four years. When he came, he had no job, no driver's license, no connection to his family, nothing. He left with a car, driver's license, a good job, uh, got an apartment on his own, and he's engaged. You know, those are things that are really impactful for the human condition. Because when you're immersed in that substance use and that lifestyle, all of that stuff is depleted. Right. And so New Beginnings, are we, we are an af advocate. And I came through models like that. So I saw it firsthand. And to provide a safe, structured, disciplined environment that's conducive for an individual to embrace a better way of living. The time is 6.25 p.m. We are here with our... We're friends now. Yeah, we're here with our <laughs> we're with our friends of uh, Kane County and also Sergeant Tony Regano of Elgin PD. Uh, question for you, Melina. What is a typical day in your job like? What do you do and how do you work with candidates? Uh, a typical day would definitely be hard to explain. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because a day can go, or I could set a day and it goes totally different. So that would be very hard to explain. My day is definitely based off the participant that I serve at that very moment or needs my attention more than the other. Um, but my first encounter, just first meeting someone, is to build a rapport. I know that you need service, but I want to know who you are. I want to learn you. I don't want you to feel like I'm coming in as a probation officer, making you feel like this is something you gotta do. Um, I want you to be comfortable enough to come to me and say, hey, this is this, this is this, nope, this don't work out. And these are the things that I say to them from the beginning. Hey, we are based off trust. I don't know how to assist you unless you are totally honest with me. We put something on the board, it's not what you want to do, let's talk about it. Let's sit on the table. So working with people is hard to explain to you exactly what the typical day is look like because I, my visit with them could be just learning them. my visit could be working on a goal um making sure that they're doing the things that they're supposed to do without feeling like they're forced to do it um in a community finding resources speaking with people it's a list of things so i couldn't really tell you what this typical day look like sometimes she starts her day at 7 or 7 30 yeah. looking for somebody like the trying to find trying the individual, find right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also, 
I, I, I want you to also let, let it be known for the folks, we're dealing with people who have already previously, previously been system impacted. So they, be, they may be more cynical than the average person going through the encounter. Is that? The so we have three types of referrals, which is the pre-arrest, social, or community referral. Okay. Um, pre-arrest, which is everybody's concern, <clears throat> is um, again, them meeting with that officer and that officer make the determination whether they need the assistance. Again, that has nothing to do with us. The only thing we're trying to do is take care of those whys. Okay. Um, again, substance you using, let's find out what happened. There is some trauma behind this. In order to be a community, understand what we have to do, you have to understand trauma. And you have to understand that one person's trauma is not determined about how you think or how society thinks that they should cope with. That's the first thing. My trauma may look different than your trauma. My trauma could be just pretty much a person sitting at home growing up by themselves because their parents have to work, the attention. That could be the trauma. So we need to find that out. Deal with mental health before we even deal with substance. Not saying that it's not going to be worked on at the same time, but I need to be able to strengthen this person's mind in order to think about substance. So there is a lot of things that goes on. We show that we care. And honestly, we do. Martha, I tell you, we have clients. I'm open. My phone stays open 24-7. If you call me, I'm coming. I'm answering. All right. It's just simple as that. Um, every call is an important call to me. We have those who have seceded and still want to utilize us, and we do that. My success is a young man. Um, been working with him less than 90 days. We expect in this progress, I don't want to say failure, but we expect that he'll. Sure. You know, right. they're gonna come up and I know come what you, down. Yeah. So yeah. we're not expecting like, okay, well, we put you here and this it. This is his second time in treatment. He's now at a sober living. The sober living is in this plane, totally out of our jurisdiction. But I made sure that he was taken care of, made sure he had food. I went to visit the sober living to see what it looked like, talk to the uh, home manager there. This is what we do because these are our people. These is the participant that served. We serve. These are the participants that trusted us. So the same way you come in is the opposite way you're going to leave out. All you right. came in with no trust. You're coming out totally trusting this program. Uh, the time is 6.30 p.m. If you are just joining us, we are talking about pre-arrest diversion, and this is a great conversation. All right. Sergeant Regano. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, question for you, sir. What has been the experience of integration and familiarity of this initiative with the Elgin Police Department? It's been rough. Okay. So change is not easy. So I'll be the first one to say that. It's been uh, examine what's working, examine what's not working, revamp it, come at it again. You're changing the hearts and minds of officers. So much like Jamie said earlier, you know, we're a system of, okay, well, you got pop for drugs, so you're going to go to court, and if you don't beat the case, you're either going to jail, you're going to rehab, or you're doing something that's court mandated. This is a completely different approach. And so we've tra I've trained the whole police department on a couple of different occasions to say, I know this is a hard pill to swallow sometimes, but this is a harm reduction model, which is not what officers think of. Harm reduction model is simple in principle, but it's hard for a law enforcement officer to accept. How? So the, the Why is that? harm reduction model is, let's say I catch someone with dope and I say, hey, this, pe this person needs help about their drug addiction, but really they might need parenting classes or really they might need a job. Or what Daryl's doing is a housing first model, which has shown the highest success rate of almost anything you're going to find out there. So could you tell an officer, hey, instead of arresting this person, why don't we find them a place to live? And the officer is going to look at you and go, what are you talking about? Right. Well, what I'm talking about is creating better outcomes. And that's really what I'm trying to get officers to understand and to, to hear and, and, and feel is like, if we approach it different and we use this harm reduction model, it's not necessarily your instincts as a police officer, right? Our newer officers are like, yeah, I love this. This is great. Um, our more veteran officers, not because they don't want to help people, but because 
it's deeply ingrained in their in their behavior to say, well, when people do things, they they get punished. Could people call that the culture of law enforcement? Sure. Yeah, we do a lot at the Elgin Police Department with something called the culture of honor, and we have a a core group of people that actually meet and just get to know each other as people, not so much as our role, and just kind of humanize who we are, what we do. And some of that has really helped too, paired with this initiative is <clears throat> some officers look at it as like, well, you're trying to soften us up. You're trying to make us soft, you know. It's not trying to make you soft. It's trying to say, we're community helpers. I just did a presentation of my, you know, kindergarten kids class about what a community helper is and what a cop does, right? And so we're community that helpers. That had to be, it was had amazing. fun. It was fantastic. <laughs> so, but, but truly, we're, we're community helpers. And the truth is that, um, a lot of us got into law enforcement thinking like, hey, I want to find ways to help people. And we're inundated with training and we're inundated with, you know, hey, you, you here's how you find legal ways to get into cars and houses. And when you find dope, you make an arrest. And that's uh -huh. what a lot of officers were trained. So to, to make that transition is hard, harder for some than others. So it's a it's a long process. Uh, we have gotten buy in from some uh, some officers. And a lot of times I had to remind them, hey, don't forget about that. They're like, oh man, I didn't think of it at the time. No problem. It's a lot better if they think of it up front before somebody's been charged because right. then it, it becomes problematic sometimes. But uh, it's always a work in progress. I'll be the first to admit that. How long have you been a uh, police officer? I've been a police officer 19 years. Wow, 19 years. For those wondering why that's cool to Curtis, I'm taking my notes so I can write this up later um well i uh so in the talks that i've had with kent county specifically ron and jamie um what i've what's been interesting to me and i think maybe mr pass you will concur is that i never thought there'd be a day where law enforcement cared <laughs> where it wasn't just and that's not to be that's not no, in a pejorative it, fashion know, no. that is just to that's just kind of to piggyback off what you said it's the the you know the the lock them up right the the bag them and tag them i think that's kind of been the mentality because i i believe and i haven't been a police officer i believe that the thought of saving the world and solving folks problems could have taken second place to the immediate thing of getting the offender off the street right. and not really caring about the level of the crime, what class it falls in, that kind of thing. So I think that, I think issues have been compounded between the community and law enforcement because of the lack of trying to look at a different way. Kind of like we've been, we've always done it this way, you know, um, but that's just my opinion on it. So you're not wrong, Curtis, you're right. I hear when people say you're not wrong. You are right. I think the problem is that's what we were told because that's we weren't supposed to care about that. We were supposed wow. to focus on what we thought was community safety, which was getting a person off the street. And it wasn't that we didn't care throughout all of the process. It's just that wasn't really what our job was supposed to be. But in reality, and looking back at it, it should have been our job. We should have been trained to do it a certain way, and we just weren't. And we can say that, especially those of us in the system right now, as the state's attorney, I can tell you I did it wrong in the past, and I am okay to admit all of that. What I am not okay with is continuing to do it this way for the future, because this is where we would fail. And so we can care. When we were in the system, when Tony would make an arrest or I would prosecute a person, I genuinely wanted them never to come back through the system because I wanted to see what was the end but we didn't have the means of finding out the why. All that we knew is that they did it. Right. And so then we tried to sentence our way out of everything. So it wasn't because they didn't care, it's just that we didn't really have the option to apply it in the way that we can now, or we could then, but what, how we should now. Okay. Or was it because the mindset was that prosecuting them, putting them through that, that the punishment will be the cure? Sometimes there it, it is. There it is. Yeah. There, there it is. is. There yes. it is. Martha Paskey. Yes. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Same thing with parenting. Yes. Yeah. Parenting for a long time, you were told if you didn't slap your child or hit your child, that you were not correcting bad behaviors. Right. 
And now we know that's child abuse. Right. You can't hit your child. There are better ways of parenting. There are better ways of doing criminal justice. But that's why there's better ways of prosecuting. We never, I don't know that we all took the philosophy that if you punish it went away. There are certain things. Like every time we put somebody in for possession um, and put them in prison, that didn't solve the problem. That put another trauma on them. I get, we get all of that now. But there was a general, genuine thought process that if you sent them to certain treatment or you sent them to therapy, that that would help. Mm -hmm. It didn't though, in a lot of cases, because we were forcing them and we weren't really getting to the underlying reason. Again, I could sentence somebody to uh, substance abuse treatment, but if I'm not getting to that underlying treatment, it's just going to fail. Right, but like you said, to, to, to that point, you know, to, to be completely transparent, that was the culture mm -hmm. once upon a time. There was no gray area at all. And there was a, such a stigma attached to an individual who was immersed in any type of uh, drug use or uh, substance behavior. And so you always had people, whether it's in the prosecutor's office mm -hmm. or in law enforcement who cared, but because of the culture, as you, you stated, you would appear weak. Because I've had, through my run, officers who really spoke to me mm -hmm. and told me, you're better than this, you know what I mean? And, and showed that humanistic side outside of the badge. You know what I mean? I've had judges do that. But the overall was, this is what you did, this is the crime. And so when I hear, I'm sitting across from an officer who's speaking about Harm reduction, man, I almost jumped out of my seat. <laughs> yeah, because that's yeah. a huge thing today, and you don't hear that coming from a big part of your profession. Right. One more thing I want to touch on, Melita, when you stated um, about it used to be, what is your problem? What's the matter with you? What happened to you? That's what's up now. What happened to you? If you play that tape back, you will see that there's that why that's there. And you use that substance and those addictive behaviors to feed that void mm -hmm. until you learn not to. Uh, the time is uh, 6.39. If you are just joining us, we are with our friends and colleagues of Kane County and Mr. Darrell Pass talking about pre-arrest diversion. Uh, so two questions, just because we are getting there with our time. Um, funding. For the program how are funds being used and what should the public know about this program and does this make us safer you take funding i'll take safe okay <laughs> so we got the teamwork down in this room y'all there's a reason why i'm not involved in what Martha sure. does. it's called numbers certainly um so i applied for grants at the federal state and local level and the grants are primarily funding the initiative currently um, one salary is coming from a, a shared effort between the sheriff's office and the state's attorney's office, but the rest of us are grant funded. Okay. Um, so we um, applied for the COSAP grant. Um, we get a lot of acronyms on our show. What is COSAP? Oh boy, I knew you would ask that. Yeah. Uh, it's the Comprehensive Opioid Stimulant and Substance Abuse Program. She got it. All right, you Martha Pass. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that's a federal grant um, yeah. through the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Um, so that was $1.2 um, from them over three years. Um, so that is the biggest portion of our funding. And then we also have um, community project funding through Representative Lauren Underwood. Um, that, come, that came to us through the SAMHSA organization. Also an acronym, I realize. <laughs> Tony, do you know it? The, and it's changed, uh, hasn't it? It's, it's mental health. It's, yes. a, it's a federal agency that oversees mental health okay. related okay. programming um, on a national level. Um, and then the CLEP grant, which is the Community Law Enforcement Partnership grant, which is a state grant. Awesome. Um, so, and then there's a num number of smaller grants that okay. <laughs> need to add. Awesome. Awesome. Um, safety. Now, safety. Yep. So, yes, it is making our community safer. Okay. And so, I, I mean, I did bristle when everybody said prosecutors wore this because I love, I love what I do. But I love what I do because I, I can make a change. Wow. Um, 
But what I do see in the community still is the criticism, and we get it from law enforcement. Yeah, that's that's one of the questions <laughs> that we have here, yeah. Um, and we get it, especially in the political arena, for people who just want to make this their statement, because they will not sit down and find out how it makes people safe. So I would challenge any single person who has a critique about this to, frankly, I would love to talk about it, but really the case managers, um, Melina, Chris, and Tatum, who Melina's here, Chris and Tatum are not here, they do this every day. They talk to these individuals. If it's as simple as making sure that a person who is doing drugs near a school doesn't do it near a school, that's harm reduction. It means we are making those kids safer. Now, eventually, we hope that we get that person to a point of sobriety, but it's getting there step by step by step. So come here, learn about the people we have actually helped and how they have not gone back into the system again, which means Tony's not seeing them on the streets. Instead, they're getting help and they're making our community safer. They are making our community safer. To okay, reiterate well, this program, I didn't mean to cut you off, sorry, but just to reiterate this program is, this is only open to non-violent, low-level offenders. Yes, and okay. this is the thing. People think, well, if you have a gun, you're in this program. No, that is not what we're doing with this. Nonviolent, low level means you're committing something that could be a lower felony or a misdemeanor case, and you're not being violent. It's not domestic violence cases. We're also not taking DUI cases where you're getting into a car and you're driving. And everything has to be related to the issue of substance use, mental health, or lack of resources. So for example, if you are just a person who's stealing a lot and it has nothing to do with that, you're going through the criminal justice system. But if you're somebody who truly is committing the crimes because of an underlying re reason, that's when we can help you. And um, what I would like for the community to understand is the process. Okay. Trust our process. Nothing happens overnight. Just as she described how it works in the criminal justice system with the courts and the this and the that, it takes months. It could be the same thing for us, but know that we are working every day every week we are accomplishing something and they have to trust that as pads as the state's attorney's office we're doing exactly what it is we're supposed to do there will be change that come but it's not when the community think that it should come but it's coming could and should the pre-arrest diversion program be replicated nationwide <laughs> it actually Absolutely. is it is okay yes. there are 65 or more sites around the country that are using the same model, the lead model. Yeah. If I could add one quick thing about the safety. Mm -hmm. So in, at the Elgin Police Department, we created what's called the Collaborative Crisis Services Unit, or another acronym for you, CCSU. So, oh, man. See? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Tony is my acronym <laughs> guy, y'all. So CCSU, we, we, we have four counselors and four sworn personnel, and we also have a, a comfort dog named Chance. And what we follow up on, and we started doing this back in 2017 and grew it to what it is today, and we started following up on these types of things. And once somebody who was identified as having these underlying issues, how many calls for service and how many ambulance transports and how many problems you know, were created versus <clears throat> we started working with them and had counselors start working with them with a different approach or a co-responder model, which means law enforcement and you know, mental health professional. And we started seeing on average, let's say somebody was responsible for about eight police calls for service. That could be any range of calls. Once they got involved with us, it was down to usually two or less, or, you know, two to zero. And so those, I did those statistical analysis in part to kind of make officers understand that it's functional. And it actually is driving down the crime rate. So I tell officers all the time, you are tired of dealing with this individual. If we actually get to the underlying problem and start addressing it, and building rapport with them, we can actually drive our crime rate down. I mean, Elgin has started doing that, uh, like I said, at, at earlier probably than 2017, and we've seen uh, like 48 year crime lows in Elgin, and that's not by mistake. I mean, we still have officers making good arrests that help drive the crime rate down, right. but they're the types of arrests that need to be made more so than just going out and making an arrest. And so. Being able to create the type stability. of arrests that need to be made. Right. I think that's the quote of the evening right there. The type of arrests that need to be made. I like that. The type of arrests that need to be made. Yeah, hmm. and I, I 
when I train the officers, I tell them, use your police powers for good. We have a lot of discretion about giving someone a break or not. Use those powers for good to get the people who don't really need to be arrested, and it's not going to do them any good, get them diverted somewhere that's going to help. So they either sometimes just divert it straight to CCSU or to pre-arrest diversion. And, uh, you know, that, that gets generates better outcomes. And not only are they not reoffending, oftentimes, they're also not becoming victims. So it's not just about them being an offender. When they're not stable, they're going to be that much more likely to be victimized, which is also really entry into the system in a lot of ways. I'm curious, um, with, with, the, with the program and the initiative that has been going on and the people that you've met and the lack of people who are um, you know, taking part in recidivism and coming back to the system, you mentioned that you get some good feedback from the folks that you come in contact with. <coughs> Bless you. Um, I'm curious on law enforcement, do, do folks come back and do they thank you? I mean, do you you know what's 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 the success stories look like? I mean, for for what you can share without names and yeah, I was gonna say for for the sake of time, and I, I can go on. So yeah. I'll give you one That's story. True. Can we get a part two? <laughs> can we get a ride along? That's what yeah, there you go. Um, I will tell you, we've had a lot of police departments come to Elgin to see what CCSU is to kind of hear about our success and you know we would have never scheduled something like this but the Rockford Police Department came in for two days to see to see what we do and to talk to our counselors and cross train some of the counselors they were bringing in from Rosecrans to, to do a, a co-responder model there and we had one of our uh, to use a good cop term that you hear frequent flyers we had one of our frequent flyers who came into the office and he came in and I said, we'll use the name John. That's not his name. I said, right. I said hey, John, these, these, uh, these guys are going to try to do what we do, but they're going to do it out in Rockford. And he goes, oh, man, let me tell you a story. And he went on to say that the quote of the day for him was, if it wasn't for these guys, I'd be dead right now. And he went on to tell all of his interactions with the police departments across the kind of Fox Valley area and the standoffs he's had, PTSD veteran. Uh, with significant mental health issues, and he said, it, "Man, I'll just tell you right now, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be dead. I mean, I, I would be dead." And he has a place; he gets to see his kid; he has a job. Good. And it's not all us, but it's helping to create stability. And um, if you can go yeah, on our website, yeah. the King County State's Attorney's website, you can go under pre-arrest diversion. A video was made um, through True. Martha and her team that has some of our actual participants in it. Now, obviously, okay. we have you know don't show their faces or their names. But they talk about it, and this was their choice to be on this program. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the beginning of our program, and those are individuals who will tell their story. I highly encourage, and we'll put this in the comments on the bottom uh, of the Facebook feed, watch this, just listen. These are real people in our community who have been helped. All right, All right. Um, I, did you have something to say? I felt like I um, bypassed you there the last couple of minutes. That, did I cut you off? No, right on my head. Okay. <laughs> I take this serious. I try to give everybody the good amount of time to speak. I, I, I take it very seriously. Um, okay, so um, why should the general public support uh, pre-arrest diversion beyond it's the right thing to do? We're going to look at it, but we do Okay. <laughs> Simple. Okay. All right. I, I, for me, you know, we're always going to have those naysayers, right? If we're looking at how can we be better, um, we just narrow it down to Kane County. We have to allow ourselves to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. If you're sitting on the sidelines just talking and dissecting uh, part of the solution, and to your point, it does take time. This doesn't happen expeditiously. This is something that at times is a glacial movement. Mm -hmm. It really is, but nonetheless, it's very impactful. So to get involved and to get informed, because I really believe those naysayers are just uninformed individuals who are just stuck in their stuff. They are. Um, they're, they're uninformed, but also to what you just said, though, too, you need to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. If, 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 if people want to talk about the, see, this is why we've been up on what the sheriff has been doing and what the state attorney's office is doing. If people want to talk about what is consistently going wrong, that's not going to help 
anybody. Not at all. Nor is that going to solve recidivism. Not at all. And and the criminal justice system can make you cynical as soon as from the time you get pulled over. Absolutely. It's it could not go your way. So you don't need to continue to talk about what's going wrong or what's gonna happen or what if you can present <coughs> a program like this to help people who are already cynical enough to see like, oh, things can change, they can work out in my favor. We're trying to double down on that. You know what I mean? But so you know what I, I found? That's why I appreciate you saying that because that's how I feel about doing this. Absolutely. You know what I found though? Some of our biggest cynics don't come around until this situation stops at their front door. What do you mean by that? that. Oh, what do you mean by that? that? I'll give you a case in point. My neighbor, who was just thought I was just a lost cause. This is when I was in my adversity uh, in Elk Grove. And when I started to get it together and really started living a better life, was still stuck in that negative. You know what I mean? It was just a matter of time. You know what I mean? You just it, it, until his nephew died from substance use. And guess what doorbell he rang? All right. Mine. And the first thing he did was apologize to me for his lack. And the first thing I did was tell him, that doesn't matter. How can I help you? That's just uninformed. And that's the culture that's been out, not just with him, across the board. If you are attached to that, you're a throwaway. And, but now we have radical compassion at this table. You have a sergeant that's talking about harm reduction. You know, you have Martha Apeski, who's, you know, the head of this uh, pre-arrest diversion. We sit at the table with the King County State's Attorney, who's telling you that her thinking before she was there, but now she's part of the, the solution. Melina, who is passionate, radically passionate, about success stories and just meeting people where they're at and working from there. That is infectious. And it's gonna take time. It's gonna take time to reach these other folks, but we just gotta to continue to be focused and in the trenches and do what we do. Well, we're happy as a show to continue to uh, share your events when you guys have the pads, uh, talks and everything. We're happy to share that stuff whenever you have it. I didn't catch off from leaving. Oh, no, you're fine. No, I, I was trying to say for those naysayers, <clears throat> I like to be real. For those naysayers and those ones out there that's perfect, <laughs> if it's your child, right. they got stopped because they're being kids. Would you think about us then? Right. Um, if I've... it's your child that is out of their mind, yeah, doing whatever, substance need mental health resources you can't help what you think about us then right so when you're being that naysayer put yourself in the shoes of those that you are looking down on right think about that first before you don't support what it is that we do the time is 6 55 p.m um monica put the link to your the website with the lead model information uh, in the chat so folks can take a look at that at their leisure uh, George says you are all doing incredible work thank you very much for that George and our dear friend Norm Peterson says thank you for all the work you do here's something that I saw then this I like here being more of a peace officer instead of a police officer <laughs> interesting and God bless you for all the work you do thank you very much and Judy Dawson is phenomenal to tell the Judy that she's got a, she got a right. shout out in the chat. Right. <laughs> and our dear friend Christopher Nelson, who we hope is getting better at this very moment, says Melina and Daryl are rock stars. Uh, now I'm just remembering that as his boss that nothing was mentioned about me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I think that we, I think we covered all of the um, yeah, important parts of this discussion. Most important were what the public can expect, um, how this is saving our residents in Kane County, how people will get referred to pass, and what each respective member of the discussion does tonight. Um, so 
If anyone else needs information, and those of you who are watching at home, uh, feel free to click the link that's in the chat now, which will go to the Kane County State's Attorney's public um, uh, the website, learn more about the LEAD model. Uh, the time is 6.57. Our show ends on a positive note. Um, we would like for you guys to give us all a message um, to the folks and the listeners of Kane County. And uh, we'll start with you, Sergeant. Can I call you Sarge? Yeah, Tony, right. Sarge, whatever you want to go with. <laughs> um, I would just encourage people, regardless of the topic, to think as a problem solver. Uh, don't be somebody in any discussion, any meeting, who only points out the negatives. Amen. Always, always, always say, the prize is here, let's keep our eyes on the prize, and how am I going to help us get there? Not how is what this person's doing problematic or this isn't going to work because of this. If it's working towards that, keep your eye on the prize and keep moving incrementally towards it and you'll get there. That's right. Good the stuff. big picture. That's right. Good stuff. All right. Big picture. I would say it's important to remember that every single one of these lives is worth investing in. And giving us a chance to give them a second chance is worth it every single time. Okay. Giving us a chance to give them a second chance. All right. My thing is that this, this program is not perfect right now, and it may never be perfect. Right. But every single time we see something that's not working, we work to make it workable. And there are going to be people in this program who are going to be great success stories, and we could tell all of that, and we can put them forth. But there are also going to be people who may not be success stories. Sure. We unfortunately lost one of our participants to what we think may be an overdose, we don't know. And that was devastating. I've never met this individual, but that was devastating to me. To our caseworker who actually spent day in and day out working with him, I can't even imagine what he feels as a result. But the thing is, we've learned from everything that we've done and we're just going to make it better. And what I ask is that we look at that. None of us are perfect. As the state's attorney, I wish I didn't screw up all the time, but I do, but I admit it right. and I make it better. And so those are the things we have to remember that every person that comes before us has that same thing. And they have a history that they're dealing with and something we may not know about. And if we don't forgive them for whatever is happening now, but just look to the future, we are the failures, not them for what they're going through. That is my ask. My ask is to give this program a chance, to give us a chance, to give every single one of these people that we're putting through this program a chance because the end result is just going to be amazing. Okay. Elena? Um, be empathetic and educate yourself before you're against this program. Be empathetic and educate yourself before you're against the program. Yes. Okay. All right. Mr. Pass? We, uh, within this, are a collective and we are advocate advocates for change in this particular arena with substance use and mental health, not activists. And so, yes, educate yourself, but on a humanistic level, that radical compassion for the individual who struggles is imperative. And we need that. We really, really need that. So patience and acceptance and education is paramount. I love it, I love it. This has been a great discussion Another good one with our friends of the Kane County uh, government. And uh, my name is Curtis. We are happy to uh, have presented this pre-arrest diversion uh, debate and discussion this evening. You will be able to view this at your leisure on our YouTube channel, listen to it on Spotify, iTunes, and everywhere else that you can listen to podcasts at. And uh, on behalf of myself and the team here, take care of yourself and each other. Have a good night. Thank you.